Hey everybody, welcome back. We are still covering Stones River National Battlefield. There's a lot to see. We won't see it all, but we're trying to show you a bunch of the major bits and pieces and some things off the beaten path like where we stand right now. You've seen us set up the battle. You've seen the Confederate juggernaut come upon the Union uh, right flank. You've seen the Union get wrecked over on the right and then make a firm stand at the slaughter pen. And here we are overlooking uh, the goal of the Confederates. And to get into that and to unpack all this, let's really talk to Jim Lewis, Chief Rangers here at Stones River National Battlefield. All right, so here at this fence line, you can see out behind me a long open field with some scrub and stuff in the middle of it. And then in the distance, the road and a hill rising up to the railroad bed. And it's from this position that the men of George Manny's brigade, which had helped break through the salient in the slaughter pen and has now made its way through the trees here will actually see from this perspective the results of the time that the fighting and dying in the slaughter pen had bought for general william s rosecrans because as they look across get to this fence and begin looking across these fields about halfway across where our tour road runs today they will see essentially almost a solid wall of blue uh, Union forces have been, you know, placed by Rosecrans, who has been busy riding up and down the Nashville Pike. He and George Thomas, who is functioning essentially as a second in command for Rosecrans during this fight, uh, will have assembled a long, elongated horseshoe-shaped line to defend their lifeline back to Nashville. And so they've got infantry ready to take them but what probably gives the confederates here at this position more pause than anything as they look up beyond that line of blue to that rise of ground behind me heading up towards the railroad is the dozens of union cannon from this position here a confederate could see about 38 union cannon massed along the nashville pike 12 of them alone where our national cemetery sits today which is just over on uh, the right side uh, left as you're looking at it of the little clump of trees out in that field over there um, as the confederates turn back and look through these woods to see how many of their own cannons are going to be coming up to help them you can guess they don't see any. I mean, the terrain through these woods riddled with the rocks and limestone like we saw back in the slaughter pen makes it impossible to advance Confederate artillery to this position here. So it is going to be a fight between massed Union artillery and infantry against just Confederate infantry as they emerge from these tree lines. In fact, when Manny gets here, he knows that nobody else has really arrived and actually determines that he's going to pull his men back into the trees and place skirmishers at this fence line until more Confederate soldiers begin to arrive. As they do, wave after wave of attack will come across these fields. In fact, one Union soldier said it was like watching the tide come in as and, you know, watching a wave break go back and then the next one comes in and gets closer and closer. The Confederates would push all the way to within 30 yards of the road, ultimately, almost reaching the promised land. But each time, those attacks would be broken up by the massed Union artillery. And artillery truly does save the day here at the Battle of Stones River. That's great, Jim. And, you know, that, that again speaks toward the danger of being an attacker. You know, you are moving on. They say you need two or three times your enemy number in order to make this happen. And, you know, there is just, you know, the Confederates are losing punch while the Union has consolidated their lines, have been able to use their artillery, have been able to assemble on some good ground. And these Confederates are really getting tired by now. Tired, they're, they're out of ammunition, yeah. everything. Yeah. And, and I think somebody said that they were jaded as well. I mean, mm. even in victory, you can be just as disorganized in that. Yeah, absolutely. Out of nowhere, I hit everybody with this without warning. So here it is, one of my favorite things, middle name trivia. We're going to start out a little bit easier. So William S. Rosecrans. Stark. Uh, George H. Thomas. Henry. Uh, let's get a little harder. Thomas L. Crittenden. Don't know. Leonidas. And a, and a harder one, too. William J. Hardy. Joseph. Joseph, bam. Okay, he passed it with a 75% score. <laughs> Jim, anything to add to this fight? This is a great part of the uh, battlefield. I mean, the, of course, this is the place. I mean, we talked about in the slaughter pen, the battle begins to turn. This is where the battle seats itself as a Union victory. Although there's going to be fighting that comes after this. Once the Confederates are unable to break the Union lines here and have to fall back into these tree lines come the evening of December 31st, um, the Battle of Stones River is really now firmly entrenched to become a Union victory. It's going to take a lot 
a lot more than the Confederates are going to be able to give on January 2nd to change this around. I think this is great. One thing I respect about William uh, Stark Rosecrans, of course, is, you know, he had his own plans for battle, but once he knew the disaster that was unfolding, there goes Van Cleve, there goes his reserves. He is doing everything he can, pretty actively, acting as a tactical he's commander. He's doing on the that, field. and he's also, in my mind, the other thing he's done, and we, you know, we've heard historians contrast, you know, or talk about the Army of Tennessee and its dysfunctionality. In the months leading up to this, as Rosecrans is getting to know his command, he's also beginning to instill in his men a spirit of feeling empowered. His brigade commanders, his division commanders feel like they can make decisions on the ground and have their play backed by Rosecrans, even if it doesn't turn out the way it's supposed to. And I think that's critical because a lot of the key decisions, we're going to be heading over to Hell's Half Acre, key decisions are going to be made by a colonel commanding a brigade not a general, not General Rosecrans, even himself, but that colonel is going to feel like, you know, I've been giving my broad job and I'm going to do it the way I see fit and I feel like Rosecrans will back my play. And it, it, already that feeling, that esprit de corps in those short couple of months has begun to happen here and we know it doesn't exist in the Army of Tennessee. That's great. We have a lot of people who aren't military, myself included, you know, who have never been watching this, but what human endeavor, what business, what organization isn't made better by people feeling like they're part of it, like they're empowered to work, and I'm sure that resonates with you all. Jim Lewis, Chief Ranger here at Stones River National Battlefield Park. Chris White behind the camera. You all for watching. Thank you so much. Go to battlefields.org to get inspired.